Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on operational risk and resilience, and the reading on risk identification. I want to begin by paraphrasing the first couple of sentences inside of this reading. And by the way, I sure hope that you guys at least glance at the reading, if not work through uh, its, its entirety. You know, some readings are better than others. Some readings are more interesting than others. These series of readings in, in this topic, I think, are really well written. There's tons and tons of good stuff in here. I wish I could give you a recording about, you know, five hours or so, but I probably, uh, I probably lose your attention after 30 minutes or so. But the first couple of sentences inside of this reading are, are really, really cool. They talk about the most dangerous risks out there. Uh, the primary one is those that are ignored, thus the title of this reading, Risk Identification. But it also mentions those that are unintended and then those that cannot be reasonably anticipated. So that's all part of this framework here in risk identification. And I want to just skip ahead here. Notice that we have you know, these four kinds of areas in, in risk management. We need to identify the risk, we need to assess it, and assessing means, you know, measuring and quantifying, and then mitigating and monitoring, and, and that kind of means managing. So I wanted to give you just a little bit of a heads up. You know, so look at these learning objectives here. We're going to do top down and bottom up. Uh, in the financial industry, we do these things all the time. But here, inside of risk management and as part of the responsibilities of the chief risk officer, it takes just a little bit of a different meaning than, than what you may have heard in you know maybe some of your other finance classes or maybe even insurance classes or other kinds of classes. We'll talk about best practices. We do that all the time. And then we'll do some operational risk classifications. And then we'll have a slide or two at the end, which interestingly enough, you, you've already seen before in, uh, in that last reading. So let's go ahead and start with top down and bottom up. You know, this is the way I explain it. And you probably heard me say this before. You know, a top down approach typically from an economics perspective, you know, looks at the entire macro ec ec economy and then just kind of laser, laser, laser focuses in down to maybe an individual firm, maybe an, an individual uh, financial security like a share of stock or a bond. The bottom-up approach does it just in the opposite manner. You know, it looks at a security and then says, okay, what are the functions out there, both internal and external, that will determine how that particular security changes to uh, inputs and variables and economies and all sorts of stuff. So you start little and you work big, you start big and you work little. That's pretty much the difference between top-down and bottom-up. So think of the two words macro and micro, and they apply here, however, the interesting part inside of this reading and what the association wants you to get is that the top-down approach begins with the senior executive leadership team, maybe like the chief risk officer. And so if you think about this, the chief risk officer wakes up every day and says to him or herself something like, what am I worried about today? What am I worried about next week? What am I worried about over this time period or this time period? Maybe even what am I worried about over the entire century? And so it's kind of a macro or a global approach. The bottom up approach uh, begins with you know, the individual employees or at least the department heads where they say something like, you know what, this inside of this silo, I'm worried about this, 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 these specific items. And then how do they flow outwards all the way outwards? And, the, and then, of course, upwards to the chief risk officer. So I love this little circle. We're going to take a look at this circle over the next handful of readings. Of course, this one is called risk identification. So that will be that will be our focus. So look at that top arrow point, understanding the risk factors. Boy, we've talked about this in many, many readings. Uh, what are common risk factors? We'll go ahead and talk more about those as we move through this slide deck. So let's start with a couple of slides on the top-down approach. So look right in the middle there, that middle, middle gray box. Senior risk owners, head of the IT, legal or compliance department. And so these individuals, they have kind of a global perspective. So what do they do? They talk about these objectives. 
And remember that objectives, they can be you know, global in a sense, they can be micro in a sense, but this reading emphasizes, and we took the word right out of the uh, reading, the, you know, these overarching objectives. And then drill down. What did I use that term earlier? La lasering, right? So not only do we need to determine what the overall goals of the business are, which of course, what do we know? You know, maximize the value to the owners of the firm, but then it's up to the board of directors and the chief risk officer and other top executives to go ahead and say, all right, well, let's have, you know, these three goals. I mean, you don't want to have 27 goals, but you know, maybe three are, uh, are appropriate. And then we're going to take a look at some risk identification tools we've spent lots and lots of time on the different measures of exposure vulnerabilities you know i tell students all the time and you probably heard me say this before that whenever you're writing a paper it's probably a good idea to you might not want to call it a swot analysis but go ahead and do strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats so that's pretty much what we're talk talking about here uh, the threat or the risk you could probably use those two terms interchangeably here at least at least in this case uh, risk wheels, we'll go ahead and uh, look at one of those here in just a few seconds. And then causal analysis. Remember, we talked so much about correlation coefficients and copulas, and those things are really, really cool. However, remember causation, <clears throat> I'm sorry, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. And so, <clears throat> excuse me again, we need to make certain that if we have some type of a fraud inside of our financial institution, that we know what the cause is and then what are the leading causes and then what maybe uh, are pieces of irrelevant information. I try to tell my students this all the time that sooner or later, they're gonna have a supervisor who says something like, hey, here's a project and they throw this stuff at, the, at my former student and the supervisor says, here, you figure it out. So one of the things one of the first things is my, I tell my students, you got to figure out what's relevant and what's irrelevant. And then what's the relationship between and among all the variables. So that's what we're doing inside of that causal analysis. Now, I thought it was fascinating that the reading mentions that uh, these workshops ought to take place two to four times a year. My, me personally, I would be in favor of doing this quarterly because, you know, these uh, risk metrics and the economy and politics, and we'll talk about this here in just a few minutes as, in more detail, you know, but these things tend to change pretty dynamically and uh, quarterly sounds, sounds better to me, although the reading says two to four, so you probably ought to remember that one. All right, bottom up, on the other hand, you know, look at the very middle box there, initiated by department heads, business unit managers, and of course, employees. And these employees could be all the way down to, uh, you know, newly hired staff. Now, the reading does mention that the bottom up approach is less popular. And this is mostly uh, because of this, you know, this enterprise risk management uh, movement that's been going on for, you know, at least a decade, if not a uh, a decade or two, you know, what that means is that we've got all these different silos and it's probably better to approach risk identification strategy from the bird's eye view looking at those silos because, well, you can see the correlations and you can see the copulas and you can probably make a better determination rather if you're just seeing inside of what goes into each different silo. But Nevertheless, bottom-up approaches are super important because they can identify unique and specific sources of operational risk. I mean, clearly, if I'm, uh, if I'm Jim and I want to borrow a bunch of money for um, my business and I walk into your financial institution and I have uh, an ID that says, hey, I'm Jim, and here's my here's my company. But suppose I went out and paid for it, and it was a fake. And you guys just said, oh, you know what, Jim, you look like a nice guy. Yes, we'll, we'll lend you uh, $2 million. Ah, so what does that mean? That happens at the, you know, the at least the employee level, if not the business unit manager level. So that's probably a really, really good a potential exam question, that fourth box there on the bottom, identify potential sources of operational risk. 
Uh, here are two examples of top down and bottom up. I'll let you guys go ahead and read these, but as you're, as you're reading these, go ahead and just imagine the difference between beginning at the top, you know, chief risk officer or beginning at the bottom of just some type of a newly hired employee. And so what's happening here is that, you know, sooner or later, sooner or later, these two approaches, they're going to meet in the middle, you know, and then they're going to pass each other, you know, so imagine, you and one of your best friends at your financial institution have the same task by your supervisor. And one says, hey, I want you to pick up fraud. I want you to, you to do top down. Your, your friend does bottom up. You know, so you're going to do this. You're going to meet in the middle. And so when you guys meet in the middle, you're going to look at each other. And neither one of you is going to have the exact same information at that point, right? And you look at each other and one of you might be saying, oh, there's, there's no operational risk here. And the other one might be saying, oh, there's tons of operational risk here. And then as you get up and you go down, you know, whichever one you are, you know, when, when you meet at the end, hopefully you'll come up with the same, uh, with the same conclusion. There's Jim's analogy for the day. So let's go ahead and th work through, you know, probably five or six slides here for top down and bottom up risk identification tools. So look at that illustration on the right. That's the PESTLE methodology. Um, I have a colleague who teaches operation stuff, and he's a huge guy on talking about the N scan and the H scan. So what this reading does is it puts the horizontal scanning in the middle, and then the environmental scanning is somewhere out. So you have to worry about politics and economics and, and all of those things. So I would remember the pestle. You know, a great exam question would be, uh, you know, pestle is this is this top down or bottom up? And so here you have this. Uh, you have this idea that clearly this is a representation of a top-down approach. But look at that first bullet point up there. Think about that top-down approach. Think about the H scan in conjunction with identifying risks before, before, uh, before they blow up. Uh, you know, as you guys know, I'm a gigantic James Bond fan. And so, you know, James Bond, he kind of waits and he kind of waits, he kind of waits. And uh, I wouldn't say that he is a top down manager because, you know, he waits to the end and then right before something blows up, you know, he saves the day. Uh, I love this last one down here, prepare themselves ahead of time. So if you do this H scan and you're perfectly aware of politics. I mean, think about what that means, especially here in the United States. Uh, you know, the economics, social, tech, you know, you got all this stuff here and we process all of this information to identify, what did I say at the beginning of this slide? You know, the chief risk officer wakes up every day and says, what am I worried about? Well, this pestle goes a long way as a formal model to say something like, you know, I'm worried about these things. Let's put it in a framework so we can identify exactly what it is. You know, the next tool is to go ahead and um, identify specific business exposures and vulnerabilities. Think about these silos. Here we are in our financial institution. What do we have? You know, uh, retail banking, we have ATMs, we have derivative securities, we have commercial lending, and we have real estate, and we have, you know, whatever these things are. If we're looking at it from the uh, Hitchcock bird's eye view, you guys ever see that old time movie? Uh, the bird's eye view, you know, you're looking down at these silos, we can see the correlations, we can see the copulas, and what we can do is hopefully we can see inside of those silos too. Well, look at those embedded bullet points there. Poor management decisions, outsourcing delays, inadequate internal controls. Considering all of these other economic factors, because look, if you're inside of that silo, you might not be as clearly cognizant of all of these external threats and external factors that are out there. So think of those great Hitchcock movies as a uh, bird's eye view, looking down at the silos. And then I love this last bullet point here, proactive steps. This is the second time uh, that I have mentioned them before they become unmanageable. Let's face it, after all, and I'm gonna go ahead and admit this, I'm not James Bond. I'm guessing you guys are not James Bond. We can't wait until, you know, the very last second to turn it off so that there's not a nuclear explosion or whatever. So that's important before they become unmanageable. So that is probably a super great exam question. 
Here's that risk wheel that I was mentioning earlier. And this is a beautiful picture of identifying the different types of operational risks that are out there. You know, so let me go back here just quickly. All right, so we're doing this H scan, and this is kind of more on a global level. Then once we narrow it down, we're gonna go ahead and try to brainstorm and identify the specific, and let me go back here. Now, even though, you know, we have politics and economy and technology, you know, we have, you know, these same kinds of things here. This is done on much more of a global level here we're kind of uh, compartmentalizing those global as they specifically relate to our different silos and then the silos as one portfolio. All right, how about the bottom up approach? So what are we doing? Uh, event and data, uh, lost data analysis, of course. You know, we have all of these processes that we're evaluating. And in each silo, you know, we have an Excel spreadsheet of uh, profits and losses. And so what we can do is we can say, all right, what's going on in this silo? What's going on in this silo? So that's the internal losses right there. Are they due to poor decisions? Are they due to accidents? Are they due to errors? I'll tell you just a quick comical story. Um, I, I, I know I, I say this in previous recordings that when I was in college for one summer, I was the world's greatest donut maker uh, in our local donut factory and uh, actually uh, was hired to be a donut maker. But then we needed to paint the factory. And so I painted, my friend and I, we painted the ceiling, we painted the walls. And so sometimes that paint came down and went right into uh, a chocolate donut. And so uh, I was a great example of, uh, you know, all sorts of those in internal losses. External losses, you know, all this stuff, analysis of losses at other firms. Of course, we want to know what's going on with our competitors, not just our competitors, but all the firms out there, because we don't really want to be in that same position. Look at the bolded down there. Can this happen to us? And then comma even might be a more important question. How do we handle it? Are we prepared for it? And what is the likely outcome? And then I love these near miss events. There's so much to be learned when you fail. I teach my children and now my children are older. They, they know the value of failing in an athletic contest, but they know the value of almost failing in an athletic contest. And then they know the value of winning. So that third near miss events, you know, that's clearly as important as internal and external losses. All right, so how about this risk and control self-assessment? Oh, so we're gonna identify these potential risks and then try to implement these preventative, preventive controls, right? So look at the little circle there. Assessment, risk identified, then uh, established controls, you know, like, all right, we identify this risk of fraud. What did I say earlier? I was Jim and I came in and I had a, a fake ID. You know, so we identify potential uh, fraud, um, how, what kind of a control do we have? You know, you could just say something like, uh, hey, Jim, let me call somebody and confirm that you are exactly who you say you are, and then the likelihood of the impact. So this uh, RCSA, super important um, to be able to not only identify the risks, but then look at that last diamond point, uh, assessed against some established criteria using our system of internal controls. And then I love this concept of process mapping. Uh, we've been doing this uh, at my school to kind of identify risks associated with students being unable to graduate in four years. You know, so we, we, we go through this mapping and we map out every student's, you know, kind of plan. We call it a degree planner. And at each stage, you know, maybe stage one is their freshman and sophomore and junior and senior year. And we do all this stuff. So there's an example there of a loan approval process. Uh, so this is super uh, obvious identification of risk, but the process mapping, so we're not just looking at one step, we're looking at the entire process from, well, who was I? I was Jim walking into the bank wanting a $2 million loan. So what the process from my actual walking into the institution and then walking out with a $2 million check. So you can see how important the system of controls at each one of these levels, at, at, at each one of these process maps is critical. 
So let me let me go back here and just uh, give you a heads up on exam questions. So look, there's a C, there's a B, there's an A. Those are bottom up. So there's a C, there's a B, there's an A for top down. And so it seems to me like the great exam question would be in the STEM just to describe one of these things and say, hey, is this top down? Is this bottom up? Where does this fit in? And so based on what we just described over uh, you know, the last 10 minutes or so, you ought to be able to answer those questions. How about best practices for the process of scenario analysis? You've heard me say this before. I, I love sensitivity analysis. I love uh, scenario analysis because what it enables us to do is say, all right, we have all these inputs. Here's an output. You know, maybe the output is uh, probability of a fraud, or maybe the out output is net present value of entering the derivative trading market. So you got all these inputs, you know, maybe there's five inputs, maybe there's 500 inputs. And so you change each of those and, you know, and then you say, okay, what's, what's the output? And then on those outputs, you can put together a distribution. You can do value at risk. You can do uh, compute exposures. You can do copulas. You can do all this kinds of stuff. What the reading does is emphasize these two types, events that are rare by nature, you know those things by just watching the Weather Channel, and those that are rare by design, you know those by reading the Wall Street Journal. So notice that bottom teardrop point, severe consequences. All right, so these are events that are highly damaging, right? So they have uh, high costs, but low probabilities. But we need to be we need to make sure that we are prepared for them i'll tell you just a quick funny story there was a there was a hurricane in 1973 i think it was hurricane agnes that washed up the whole east coast of the united states and uh, my dad was prepared for this. He got his garbage can out. And when our basement flooded, he got the garbage can and he was whooshing the water out our back door. And uh, as a 12 year old, it was really quite an experience in risk management, even though I, I didn't know it. And my dad was able to get the water out, but there probably would have been more, more efficient ways. So that's what this scenario analysis, you know, I do have a reason for telling all these stories. That's why this scenario analysis is super important because what it does is it would replace my father's garbage can with, well, I don't know what else, you know, maybe squeegees or, you know, something else. I don't really know what else we could have done back then. That water just came down so fast. All right, we've talked about the, uh, the BCBS uh, in multiple recordings, uh, you know, in the, in the past. So in March 2021, we have these, you know, kind of new guidance encourages banks to do what? Perform stress testing and scenario analysis. We've done that. Choose scenarios, the full range of possible material outcomes. So, you know, that's so cool. And it's difficult to do inside of an Excel spreadsheet. You know, that's why financial institutions, you guys know this better than I do, have much more sophisticated tools than just, uh, than just Excel so that you can capture all of the possibilities that are out there. And, you know, I always hesitate to say that. You don't want to it's almost impossible to capture all of the scenarios, but I promise you that there were some people in 2018, maybe even 2020, I'm sorry, 2018, maybe 2010, maybe 2000, maybe 1980, even before most of you were born, uh, were putting together some kind of a scenario analysis with a pandemic. Uh, you know, but most of us, most of us were not. Yeah, all relevant lines of business. So think about all those silos qualitative and quantitative techniques. Now we're going to go ahead and emphasize that in the next reading where we do the assessment. We're going to, we're going to measure, we're going to quantify, we're going to assess both quantitatively and qualitatively. And then, you know, all organizations that provide designations and testing for those designations, uh, they are big on monitoring and reviewing. And so that's the last one there. You know, I love these kinds of brainstorming workshops. I do this with my students every once in a while about just, you know, problems that they're having in classes, problems with getting a job. And brainstorming is really just uh, an, an application of, you know, what's on your mind and how can we solve these problems? Hmm. Some involve external experts. I, I've done this in the past. I haven't done it in years. 
where I have gone and been just, you know, some kind of a facilitator. And, you know, I asked all sorts of questions. So you go in prepared to ask a series of questions, but then as an external individual, you learn by the answers. And then that you go down this path over here and that path over there. And all of a sudden we're identifying risks. What did I say that, uh, what did I say that in that very beginning was the very first couple of sentences in this, in this reading? The most dangerous risks are those that are ignored. And so we ignore a risk sometimes because we don't understand it, but sometimes we just don't even know what those risks are. So what are the tasks? This is obvious stuff here for these brainstorming workshops, external lost data, internal lost data, you know, what we talked about with the RCSA, uh, critical risk indicator scores, known vulnerabilities, and possible unknown vulnerabilities. Remember, the uh, we did that whole matrix where we know some things, and we don't know some things, and we don't know that we know some things, and we don't know that we don't know some things. So that harkens back to a previous uh, recording and reading. And so the next step then, of course, is to say, all right, what comes out of the workshop? You know, we've got these I'll just pick a number, 50 things. Well, let's ignore the bottom 10, you know, about these, you know, first middle, what do we do with those? Well, let's put those over here, but these are the top five or the top three. So identify those top risks. Remember in a previous recording, we had, you know, some factors over here and, you know, what was the total percent that contributed to the losses? So that's probably an important table to construct. Do we have biases? Of course, the, the, as humans, we have all sorts of biases. We make cognitive errors up here and we have emotional biases here. And so the reading uh, discusses myopic bias. Uh, I always uh, use this word in my family because nobody can remember anything that happened a long, long time ago. I'll say something to my sons. I'm like, didn't I tell you last week not to do this? You know, whatever it is. Oh, no, dad, you never told us that. So, you know, of course we need to avoid this recency bias. You know, we put huge emphasis on recent events, but, you know, of course, inflation in 2022, that's super important. COVID in 2019, that's super important, but it doesn't lessen the 20, the 2008 financial crisis. It doesn't lessen September uh, 11th. It doesn't lessen the stock market crash of 1987. It doesn't lessen the stock market crash of 1929. What we need to do is, you know, try to throw that myopia out of our brains and say, you know what, we still can learn from history and we know that history repeats itself. So let's focus on the timing of that history repeating itself. And then we can always blame it on somebody else. That's that external cause bias. All right, how about a typical workflow? I'm not gonna read this stuff to you here, but this makes perfect sense here. You know, this comes out of, of what I was just saying just a few moments ago, you know, what are the biggest concerns? So what did I say earlier? The chief risk officer wakes up every day and says, you know, what can go wrong today? What can go wrong over the next year, the next decade, the next century? But let's go ahead and find out from others you know, what are our biggest challenges over the next one to three years? So then we have these detailed discussions and then we create a list and then we try to put them into some kind of a category. Maybe they fit into a pre-category that we know about like fraud, but maybe they don't fit into a pre-category. You know, like I'm not a social media person. Uh, in fact, I'd love to take a sledgehammer to my phone, but clearly social media is out there and lots of people use it. And if we have a problem with social media, I'm not sure that we have a category. You know, maybe we need just some kind of a social media category that might include fraud. It might include misrepresentation. It might include rogue trading. It might include, it might include, you know, so there are different layers here. So that categorization will uh, probably help. And then look at the fifth one. I always like looking out and say, you know, what are those people doing over there? Uh, an industry set of, you know, kind of scenarios or standards. All right, how about this uh, taxonomy, which is a fancy word for classification. So we have level one, level two, and level three. We have some examples here in not this slide here, but the next slide. Here's example of level one. Here's the slide that we showed you 
I can't remember if it was in the second or maybe back in that first reading. So we have these uh, event type categories. We call these level one. It's probably not a bad idea for you to get your phone out and go ahead and take a picture. Uh, I said this in that previous recording that the great exam question, if I'm writing a question, I'm going to go ahead and put something in the question stem that might be like, uh, you know, natural disasters over there on the far right. And then, you know, your multiple choices would be, you know, pick, pick any of those four, and that would be the fifth one, damage to physical assets. So memorize those level one categories. And then here's uh, another table, I'd take a picture of this one too, some examples of level two and level three, those are activities. So notice that at level three, we're really getting down into real specifics and then general and then internal fraud. So just imagine that what we could do, you know, we could have internal fraud there, that's number one. So I could, we could have put together seven more of the slides, but we didn't. You guys could probably figure that out yourself. So that takes us through uh, our learning objectives. And so my advice is to go ahead and look through the reading. I mean, even if you don't digest, you know, word for word, but there's lots and lots of good stuff in there and some pretty good examples. But it's also important for you to understand that this is in the context of these series of six or seven readings under operational risk and resilience. So always have in mind operational risk and resilience as you go through these readings. Hey, thanks for watching and have a great day and good luck studying.